After roughly 20 years of peace, the world went to war for a second time. Welcome to WatchMojo.com, and today we'll be exploring how World War II began. The Second World War is considered a direct result of the First World War due to unresolved tensions and anger from that conflict. However, the Great Depression of the 1930s was another factor that led to bitterness and a shift in public attitudes towards strict dictatorships. World War I also facilitated the rise of Adolf Hitler and his Nazi party. Hitler's allies in Italy and Japan also acted aggressively with the hope of expanding their territories. Hostilities by these countries towards the communism of the Soviet Union was just another factor that helped lead to war. In fact, a number of ideologies helped spark the war. Aggressive expansionism by countries like Germany and Italy, fascist dictatorships, and deep-seated racism were all considered contributing factors. This racism was mostly in Germany, where the Nazis believed the Aryan race was the master race and superior to the Slavic people. The countries that eventually formed the Allied Alliance acted passively in the face of the Axis threat. This was partly out of sympathy, partly out of guilt because of the Treaty of Versailles that blamed the Germans for World War I, and partly because countries like Britain underestimated Hitler. Meanwhile, the League of Nations proved itself ineffective in the fight to keep the peace. A few months after Japan withdrew from the League of Nations in 1933, Germany did the same. In 1935, Germany violated the Treaty of Versailles by introducing mandatory military conscription and by beginning rearmament. That country continued to violate the treaty in the years that followed. In fact, in 1936, Hitler remilitarized the Rhineland. It was around this time Nazi Germany formed their important alliance with Italy. Soon after, the two countries offered support to the separatist movement in the Spanish Civil War, while the existing government was supported by the Soviet Union. These events foreshadowed the Second World War as both sides were testing different methods and weapons of battle. One specific event that foretold the horrors of World War II was the April 1937 bombing of Guernica. By 1938, Hitler's motives were clearer. In a move referred to as the Anschluss, the Nazis annexed Austria into Germany, despite the fact this also violated the Treaty of Versailles. Later that year, Hitler was appeased by both Britain and France when they signed the Munich Agreement. This allowed Hitler to overtake a German-speaking section of Czechoslovakia in order to keep the peace. In August 1939, Nazi Germany signed a peace treaty with the Soviet Union. However, the first official event of World War II followed soon after. Due to long-standing tensions, Germany invaded Poland on September 1, 1939. Britain and France warned Germany that should the troops not withdraw, war was imminent. When the Nazis did nothing, Britain and France declared war on Germany and World War II officially began. Little introduction video, of course, on how World War II started, of course, in 1939. So, anyway, welcome you back, Daniel Simon at Baton Rouge Community College. Everybody, everybody had a great weekend, uh, pretty much overall. Uh, of course, this week I'll be getting in my last live lectures. I think I'm probably going to have for, uh, of course, the fall semester 2022, which, of course, uh, I'm going to talk about World War II pretty much today and also Wednesday later uh, in the week. So, it right, looks like i got a bunch of students I know watching live uh, right now. Uh, I know it um, looks like Lulu came in earlier. Good morning. Uh, and also Brianna. Hey, what's going on? Hope you had a great weekend. Uh, Brit Brittany also is watching, I know, this morning, along with Ashlyn. And, of course, looks like we also got Steph coming in uh, also uh, as well. A bunch of you, of course, will watch this later, of course, this uh, lecture. Um yeah, this week, yeah, I'm going to kind of wrap up my main lectures, which will go towards our final exam. Uh, pretty much our final uh, fourth semester is going to be on the rise of fascism in World War II. Uh, I think I'll have some recorded lectures on the Cold War I'm going to give you later, uh, which I'm going to probably have some kind of bonus assignment toward that uh, at, the, at the end of the semester. So let me uh, talk about a few things about the class right now, where we're at, I think, assignments-wise. Uh, I know uh, we have uh, several assignments out right now, which uh, a lot of these, I know the second exam is going to be due uh, at the end of the week. Uh, so I think by the weekend, uh, second exam. So that's something y'all need to kind of be working on right now uh, to kind of wrap up. And then last week I did give you that World War I quiz, which I think had some of the 19th century lecture in it. I know that too. It's primarily on the First World War. 
uh, that particular assignment. And now that second exam bonus quiz, if you haven't started on that, uh, that's just a kind of a video assignment I gave you uh, on the Red Baron uh, to work on. Uh, so that's something y'all need to kind of for extra credit if you want to do that too uh, as well. Uh, third vocab, uh, also I did push that back. Uh, that's due this Friday, uh, which of course is, I think it's November 18th, uh, due at midnight. So uh, that's something y'all need to kind of work on. There will be a fourth vocab, a final one. I think I've already posted that too, uh, but that's not due, of course, until uh, December the 9th. So we do have a lot of assignments and they kind of get stacked up uh, at the end of the semester. And then, of course, don't forget, you got your book report. I think a research paper you have to do on the book report book you pick, you know, for the semester to read. Uh, I think I did tell you I gave you more time on that, uh, which will be due after Thanksgiving holiday uh, next week, uh, November November uh, 28th, which is a Monday. So you get, you know, two more weeks to kind of get that out the way and get that wrapped up. Uh, so anyway, like I said, my lecture today, I'm going to, of course, start on talking about, of course, the background of World War II. We'll mostly talk about like the early stages of the war, uh, how World War II broke out in 1939. I'll kind of go through uh, the stages of the war up to like at least 1941. So I'll kind of talk about how Soviet Union gets into the war because Nazi Germany attacks them. And then, of course, Japan also attacks uh, the United States as well, and you know, gets them in the war by December of 1941. So war kind of changes, you know, uh, you know, by 1941. We'll see that, of course, a little later. So if you have any, you know, comments, questions, you know, during the live stream, you know, uh, let me know, of course, or you can always leave them later on my channel. Uh, you can also leave comments, of course, in the Canvas discussions, of course, I've got with the class as well. And you can also subscribe to my channel if you want uh, also. So uh, anyway, um, I'm going to, of course, talk about some of the background. We had, we had talked about, uh, I think, like the beginning of the war a little bit, kind of how uh, Poland kind of is the main you know, catalyst that really starts World War II uh, at this point where Nazi Germany, you know, invades, uh, you know, Poland, et cetera. We'll, we'll get to that in a second. I did want to talk about uh, kind of, you look at this, uh, kind of the causes of World War II, uh, kind of underlying causes that they've kind of talked about in that video, you know, uh, underlying issues like the whole Treaty of Versailles. They thought that, you know, Germany had been heavily punished, you know, after the war. And so a lot of the allies in the West felt guilty about that. Uh, extreme nationalism, which, you know, fascism was one thing that, that created that, that really led to World War II. Uh, economic depression due to the Great Depression, which was pretty much worldwide, uh, that causes part of why Japan becomes such a fascist state uh, later. Rise of dictatorships, policy of appeasement. You know, the Western powers like Britain tried to appease Hitler by giving him land for peace and things like that, and that didn't really work, you know, uh, in the end. American isolationism, too, because America, you know, between the wars really wasn't doing much to get involved in international issues, the League of Nations and so on. Uh, and so you get this Axis powers we'll talk about later. You know, that you have Nazi Germany allies with Italy, uh, like 1936, and then, of course, later Japan, 1940, with the Tripartite Pact, of course. Then, of course, you see the direct cause, of course, of, you know, World War II is obviously Germany invading, you know, also Poland. So that's, you know, pretty much the main catalysts that really lead to why, you know, World War II uh, begins. Now, um, I want to talk about a few things that happened before the war broke out, like going back to like as far back as May of 1939. Uh, they did have this thing that happened in May of 1939, you may have heard of, called the Pact of Steel. Uh, that happened. And uh, before, uh, you know, Germany invaded Poland, they made this agreement with uh, Mussolini and Italy, which was like a 10-year deal, 10-year pact it was with them. It was called the Pact of Steel. And it was kind of like this military alliance uh, that was kind of conditionally made between the two countries. And the agreement was, I guess, if either country got attacked, basically they would help each other uh, in, in, in a war. And so that's what led to part of why the Axis powers forms afterwards uh, was because of the so-called Pact of Steel. Uh, that was on May 22nd, of course, 1939. Uh, you can see an image there, of course, of Hitler right there at that meeting uh, with that. But 
really the most famous thing that happened uh, prior to World War II was the molotov Ribbentrop Pact, uh, which has been called all kinds of names. Uh, it's also been called the so-called Non-Aggression Pact of the Soviet Union, uh, which Nazi Germany made, you can see, August 23, uh, 1939. Uh, Hitler was really concerned that Germany, like in World War I, would have to fight a two-front war, you know, east and west. Uh, and so um, he had basically the, the German foreign minister, uh, which was Joachim von Rippentrop, uh, meet with the foreign minister, uh, of course, which was uh, Yakislav Molotov. Uh, and so those two met, kind of flew back and forth between Germany, of course, uh, and the Soviet Union, uh, and uh, they made several agreements, by the way, uh, in, in this pact, of course, uh, between them. I'll kind of talk about uh, one was that um, basically they agreed to they, they agreed to split up Poland because I think both kind of saw those areas as areas that uh, I think the Soviets kind of saw the eastern part, at least, of Poland as theirs in Germany. It could control part of Poland uh, at one point as well, uh, and so they agreed to split it in half. Germans would get uh, the western part, and the Soviets would get the eastern part. And the Germans, you can see, they also gave control of the Baltic states to the Soviets. They can come in and take it over, which they would uh, afterwards. Uh, here's kind of some other images of, of course, right here. Of course, part of the agreement was that Germany wouldn't have to fight you know, the Soviet Union for 10 years, 1939 uh, the 1949. Uh, of course, as you know, it held for 22 months. Because uh, later, you know, would occur, Nazi Germany would invade, of course, Soviet Soviet Union in June of 1941. You know, at least that's they think there. And Stalin didn't think that they would either. And I think Stalin gets caught off guard. You know, uh, 1941, of course, when Nazi Germany does invade, of course, the Soviet Union. Uh, here's kind of a map showing you how they would divide it up later in this German-Soviet pact. But you can see uh, the area of Poland, of course. Uh, would be based on the western part would go to the Germans, and then you can see the eastern part uh, would go to the Soviet Union, and then they would take control of the Baltic states, which they would, of course, in 1940. But part of the thing was the thing that, that, that I think Hitler wanted the most was that he didn't have to fight a two-front war. So Soviets were kind of like almost like allied with the Germans when they did go into Poland, but uh Soviet Union was kind of neutral, if you know about that at the beginning of the war. But a lot of the German war machine was being fed by the Soviets. It's kind of ironic that they attacked them later. So that's kind of what's going on at the beginning of the war. You got this, you know, German-Soviet pact that's being created right before the war. And I think the West kind of knew about this, but they didn't know how they were going to divide up Poland, stuff like that, uh, at that point. Now, let me get into the early stages of the war, of course, which we'll talk about between 1939 to 1941. Uh, of course, the big thing that happens, like I said, that caused World War II to break out in 1939 was, of course, Nazi Germany's invasion of Poland. Uh, and um, this was actually an idea that the Germans had been working on for months, like several months, I think, going back to, uh, they think, the spring, spring of 1939, uh, and um, it was called different plans, but the common name they called it later was called Fall Vice or Case White. These were like the military operation plans to attack Poland, uh, which they went from three sides, East Prussia, Germany, and also where Czechoslovakia is. Uh, and um, the invasion of Poland, which happened not September 1st, is the beginning date of, is the seen as the beginning date, of course, of World War II. It would spark, you know, the Second World War, uh, which would, by the way, last about six years. That's how long, of course, the war uh, would last, which would result in like 50 million or more people killed worldwide. So it's, you know, considered the, the bloodiest conflict in human history uh, that there ever was. Uh, and, um, because the fact that they do invade, you know, invade, you know, Poland, that that causes other countries to come in. Initially, uh, Britain and France, of course, you see there, will declare war 
uh, on Nazi Germany because of that, which will happen on September the 3rd, September 3rd, 1939, is when they officially declare war. I think the Germans thought they wouldn't do that, that they wouldn't come into the war. They thought, you know, just like Czechoslovakia or whatever, uh, they'd just be able to take it and they wouldn't do anything about it. Uh, But that's not the case uh, with this. And so pretty much they... They're both 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 sides, of course, are at war at this point. Uh, here you can see, by the way, uh, the actual uh, invasion of Poland, which you can see the Germans invaded, like I said, from where Czechoslovakia is, Slovakia, I guess you see there, Germany uh, to the west, and then from East Prussia, uh, they also attacked. Uh, and um, Poland, by the way, uh, fell pretty quick. Uh, part of what fell so fast uh, was because of the German so-called blitzkrieg uh, that the media called it. Uh, And this was like a new form of military tactics, like offensive style warfare, uh, which used like a combination of mobilized forces like tanks, uh, trucks, and other kinds of vehicles, and then air power, fighters and bombers uh, neutralized the enemy. Uh, And so uh, blitzkrieg, which meant lightning war, uh, was a tremendous, you know, type of new tactic that really changed warfare uh, forever. And so for the first few years, like first two or three years, uh, the Germans just overwhelmed uh, their enemies uh, on the battlefield, and they were able to conquer vast amounts of territory uh, throughout Europe and even parts of North Africa, etc. Uh, so so-called German blitzkrieg, uh, they say, was the brainchild of this uh, German general named Heinz Guderian, you may have heard of him, uh, who pretty much was the one that um, developed like a lot of the, how they fought with like tanks, like panzer divisions and things like that, uh, the, the, the Germans. And so they helped to really revolutionize, you know, warfare uh, throughout throughout World War II. Uh, the irony, though, was that they still had, if you know about World War II, they still had to use like horses and stuff, like to move like artillery and other things around. Uh, so they still were using horses, you know, but obviously... Uh, this changed warfare, and it's pretty much why the uh, Germans were able to overwhelm, like, the French and the British in the West, uh, like when they took France, because uh, of these mobilized forces uh, that they have. Because they would have had that in probably World War I, they may have done that uh, easier. Uh, now, afterwards, like I said, Poland didn't laugh. Poland, like, fell in, like, three or four weeks. Uh, it fell, of course, and the Soviets came in and took over the eastern half of it, and so you can see how they kind of broke it up. Uh, you know, the different areas of Poland. So the eastern part was taken over by the Soviets along with the Baltic states. And then, of course, the western part, of course, was taken over by the Germans. And uh, we'll get to it later, but they do commit a lot of atrocities uh, in Poland, especially the Germans, uh, where they they kill a lot of, you know, Polish Jews and other non-Jews uh, as well. I forget some like, I forget how many uh, Poles died in World War II, but it was something like six million people uh, that died. Uh, that kind of give you an idea, kind of part of the whole Holocaust thing, of course, in World War II later. Uh, but that's that's kind of what happens with Poland, uh, et cetera. And, um, but what happened after Poland was kind of a strange thing. Uh, they had this thing called the Phony War uh, that occurred uh between 1939 to 1940, which happened like six, seven months or so uh, between both sides. And it was actually a period where there was like a lull in the war, where very, very little fighting was being fought between like the Germans and the Allied side. Uh, Italy hadn't come into the war yet. Italy doesn't come into the war where, until um, Germany actually attacks the West, like France will come in afterwards. Uh, so at, at this point, it's Germany versus France and Britain. Uh, France and Britain really aren't doing much to help out Poland. Poland pretty much just falls, uh, you know, uh, and there's some fighting like in France and Belgium versus, you know, the Germans. Uh, but um, I think they had different names they called it. Some people call it the Sitzkrieg, I think was the German name because they were kind of sitting around, not really, you know, kind of waiting the war and to see what, what Hitler was going to do, his next move. Uh, I think there were some cases where some people thought they weren't going to attack attack the West. And Hitler just wanted Poland, uh, that kind of thing. I think the French call it the Funny War. It was another variation. Uh, they spell phony different ways. I think the 
the English or British spell it with an E, phony, and without it, without an E. So spell it either way, uh, usually. Uh, but if you know what happened uh, in in that time period, there were a few things that did occur uh, between, I guess, 1939 and 1940. Well, if you know what happened, uh, Finland and the Soviet Union went to war. Uh, interesting thing about that. Uh, and um, they fought over uh, part of the... Um, territory of Finland above uh, where St. Petersburg is, uh, and it lasted like just roughly about four or five months between both sides. Uh, and it was a very bloody conflict. Uh, the, the I think the Soviets would win the conflict, but they fought in like winter conditions uh, where some of the soldiers even had to you know use like skis and things like that. And uh, they think it kind of influenced um, uh uh, Hitler to later defeat, uh, will we'll try to defeat the Soviet Union, like invade it in 1941, because the fact that the Soviets took high casualties trying to trying to fight the Finns, and Finland hated the Soviet Union. They 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 had broken away from them, and become independent, you know, after World War One, uh, and so Finland Finland would later support uh, Nazi Germany. Uh, I think I think mostly between 19 I think 41 to 44 uh, during the war. Uh, to get get territory back from them and all that, so so called winter war they sometimes dub it, which was kind of going on during the phony war. Uh, then the other thing that happened too uh, was that um, Germany decided to attack Denmark and also take Norway, uh, which was kind of vital to control uh, the western part of the Baltic Sea, uh, which they wanted. And then also uh, on top of that, Sweden, uh, which was next to Norway, uh, had a lot of natural resources, uh, and so uh, like iron ore and so on. And so that's they basically took that uh, in between, like I think around April, March, April, about 1940, uh, they would seize that. And the British would try to send forces in to try to help them, but uh, it was pretty much a failure. And uh, the Germans will actually occupy Norway throughout all, the whole war. 1940 to 1945. Back in Norway, they put in this um, Nazi collaborator that ran their government, that was pro-Nazi government, uh, Vidkun Quisling. Uh, and so he, he basically was put in power. I think it was a case with even trying to round up Jews uh, in Norway and stuff like that. And Quisling was considered a traitor uh, after the war and was later shot uh, for that issue. In fact, the word Quisling, I think, now means like a traitor today in Europe. Now, I wanted to talk about the main thing that would happen, you know, to end the lull in the war. The phony war is going to eventually come to an end, of course, in the spring of 1940. Uh, the, the Germans uh, come up with this invasion plan that they call different names. Some people call it the Manstein plan. Uh, some people call it the Fall Gelb or Case Yellow, which was a Nazi Germany's operation to invade Western Europe, uh, take France, uh, Holland, et cetera, Belgium. Uh, and uh, they had been working on this over the winter, between the winter of 1939 to 1940. Uh, and uh, if you go to that image right there, um, that was the general that developed it, a uh, general named um, von uh, Eric von Manstein, uh, who, by the way, a lot of historians think that Manstein was one of the best generals under Adolf Hitler. I mean, that and maybe Erwin Rommel and a few others that were pretty good and um, I think Hitler tried to take credit for it, uh, if you know about, about this invasion plan, which was to attack, really, part of it was to attack into Holland, but the main main thrust of the actual attack into the West uh, was through, like, southern Belgium, uh, through what they call the Ardennes Forest, uh, the so-called sickle cut, I guess what they called it sometimes also as well. And uh, you can see the difference between the two plans. Uh, number one plan, that was the one, the Schlieffen plan, where they attacked through Belgium uh, to try to take Paris uh, from, I guess, the north. And then the other version was to try to actually attack uh, the other way. That, that second plan you see, the Manstein plan, 1940, uh, the idea was to attack through the Ardennes and then come up the coast where Calais is. And then in, I guess they were trying to cut the Allies in half what they're going to do, circle that northern area where Belgium is in Holland, take that first, and then take France uh, in that order. So that was considered to be 
a lot better military plan compared to the one uh, in 1914. And Manstein later wrote a series, of, wrote a book about uh, his experiences with Hitler, um, the lost victories. Uh, and um, if you know about Manstein and Hitler, they did not get along. And Hitler later had him fired and all that. But he, I think after he fired him, they, they, the Germans started playing, uh, doing real bad in the war. Uh, here's kind of a map to show you what things look like on the Western Front. Uh, the French, uh, if you look down on the bottom right there, had an area close to Switzerland called the Maginot Line. That was their defense line uh, on the eastern part uh, of, of France on the German border. Uh, but the Germans would go around that military defense. Uh, they would attack more to the north uh, through uh, Belgium and into Holland or the Netherlands. And so um, that was actually the weakest point along the Western Front, uh, was like around Belgium. Uh, and so uh, one of the things that would happen on May the 10th uh, to the 14th, 1904, the Germans concentrated their forces uh, around where the Ardennes, Ardennes Forest is, uh, which is like in part of Belgium in northern France. Uh, close to where the city of Sedan is, which is kind of a strategic city, by the way, back in 1870 in the Franco-Prussian War. And so the idea was they were going to try to break through there, race toward the English Channel, and then encircle the Allies in Belgium. Uh, and um, here's kind of an image, by the way, of the Ardennes Forest. Uh, the Allies didn't think that they'd be able to push through there, uh, through the Ardennes Forest, thick forest, uh, you know, bring tanks through there and things like that. Uh, and so uh, British and French didn't really put a whole lot of forces there. And so that was really the weakest spot on the Western Front. And so what did the Germans do? Uh, the Germans then pushed most of their tank forces right through there. About 80% of the Panzer divisions actually went through the Ardennes, uh, which was really the greatest thing that Hitler probably did in World War II was that attack right there uh, he did. Uh, and so uh, what ends up happening is the Germans were able to break through. Uh, in fact, the date, I think the Battle of Sedan was like May 12th to the 15th, 19, 1940. Uh, they were then able to break through there uh, in the Arc Dens, you see there, uh, which Guderian helped lead. By the way, Guderian's uh, was one of the main generals that led the breakout at at our at, at, yeah, the call for the breakout at S Sedan is also I think called as well. Now from there you can see then the Germans through there uh, raced you can see uh, up through northern France uh, to where Calais is uh, on the English Channel. Uh, the French and the British did try to counter it and try to stop the. Uh, you know, German invasion through here uh, called Wagen's Plan, named after one of the French General Wagen, but it failed. And so from there, what happened was the Allies got cut in half uh, their forces. Uh, and so uh, most of the British forces, uh, BEF, British, British Expeditionary Force, that came over to aid the French uh, in the Western Front, a lot of them got surrounded uh, in part of like, Northern France and Belgium. Um, you can see the Belgian army is also trying to fight to uh, the Germans. They, they pretty much later capitulate uh, at the end of May. And in the French forces, part of them get cut off and the rest of the French forces are in France. They're cut in half, you know, pretty much at that point. And so that forces the um, British to get out because uh, they realize if they, they don't get their forces out, they'll all get captured or killed by the Germans. And so that leads to what they call the so-called miracle of Dunkirk, which um, often the whole operation is later referred to as being called Operation Dynamo. And what happens is the British basically evacuate their forces by sea. They bring in like all kinds of ships, naval vessels uh, to get, get people out at that point. Otherwise, they'll get trapped and you know, captured and all that. And this happens over a period of like eight to 10 days uh, that, that the British try to get forces out. And they bring any kind of ships, not just destroyers, other kind of similar ships, but any kind of ship that they could get, like yachts and so on. They were steamers or whatever else they could bring in, were all brought in uh, to get people out. 
You can see May 27th to about uh, June 4th, 1940 is the date of where they evacuated from Dunkirk uh, in, in uh, northern France. Uh, and um, later called the so-called Miracle of Dunkirk, uh, you can see how a lot of men uh, had to actually line up on the beaches uh, to get out. Uh, they had to leave all their equipment behind, uh, you know, trucks uh, and so on. Any kind of tanks or whatever they had was all left behind, except for, I guess, their rifles or whatever. Uh, and um, here's other images. Of course, what happened was the Germans tried to bomb them, like Luftwaffe, of course, tried to come in and, uh, you know, to prevent them from really uh, evacuating. And uh, they think Hitler could have probably prevented the, the, the troops from really you know, like leaving if they would have like just in, invaded and took it. But uh, they, I think Carmen Goering wanted to use the Luftwaffe to try to stop them and all that, and that actually failed. But they're able to get out on, on various ships and so on, and that's going to be important later. Uh, all these soldiers will be later, you know, be used to fight against uh, Nazi Germany uh, in, in the war. Now, of course, the other thing, of course, that happened, of course, in World War II, after, you know, Belgium eventually does fall uh, along with part, along with Dunkirk, they eventually, I guess, whatever troops that are, don't get out, of course, get captured uh, by the Germans. But pretty much you have the Battle of France, uh, pretty much that continues after that, uh, which will go on for like about six weeks uh, from May to June of 1940. And so from there, the Germans then march on northern France. Uh, and route the Allies within just, like I said, a few weeks. Uh, in fact, by June 16th, uh, what ends up happening is the Germans march into Paris uh, and take it, uh, which that was considered one of the also one of the greatest triumphants, probably of Hitler in the war. You know, what he did was take Paris. You know, that kind of thing. Uh, and um, you know, of course, images of, of Hitler visiting Paris, uh, like the Eiffel Tower. Uh, and also, uh, you can see Hitler on the right visiting also the tomb of Napoleon uh, as well. Uh, it's the only time that Hitler really visited Paris, of course, during the war. And uh, what happened was the um, Germans uh, forced the French to eventually surrender. They would surrender officially on June 22nd, 1940 uh, in an armistice. So the French were knocked out of World War II early. Uh, in 1940, like they were only in the war less than a year, uh, fight, fighting the Germans. And uh, one of the things that Hitler did was he forced the um, French to get out that old railway car that they had, you know, remember, forced the Germans to sign the armistice uh, in November 11th of 1918. Uh, and so they kind of made them eat crow, uh, if you know about that, in 1940. So you can see the old railway car in the background that they had, you know, used in 1919. So the French had to basically sign another armistice to end that part of the war for them. I think Hitler later had it blown up. Uh, if you know about that, uh, that actual railway car afterwards. Uh, what was the result of, by the way, the um, French being defeated in the war? If you know about, they divided up France afterwards into two areas. Uh, they had occupied France, like a northern zone uh, that Nazi Germany occupied uh, throughout most of the war because they wanted control of uh, the English Channel and part of the Atlantic, like for their U-boats, uh, et cetera, uh, to attack in the Atlantic. Uh, and so um, so occupied France, uh, you know, Paris uh, kind of was still the capital, but it remained this open city during the war. Uh, that was really never bombed uh, in World War II. Uh, and so that's kind of how the northern part of France was, you know, controlled pretty much by the Nazis. And in the southern part of France, uh, they had an area uh, which uh, was called Vichy France. Uh, Vichy France, which you see on the bottom there of that map, uh, which was based in Vichy, uh, which was a city in uh, kind of central southern France. And... Um, what was uh, Vichy France? It was kind of like this pro-Nazi uh, puppet type state uh, that was uh, led by uh, General Petain or Marshal Petain. He was the basically the head of it, of this state. 
Uh, if you remember him, uh, Patain, uh, he had um, fought in World War I, he was one of their great generals, you know, that helped defeat the Germans at the Battle of Verdun, uh, they called the Lion of Verdun, uh, you know that. And so he uh, kind of was a collaborator with the Germans during the war. And later, uh, Patain uh, was seen as this traitor, you know, after the war. I think I've got the image of Patain right here, Marshal Patain, they usually call him, or Henry Philippe Patain, I think is his full name uh, as well. Uh, but he was considered a traitor you know, after the war. I think it was later, I wanted to say, prisoner or put under um, house arrest uh, after the war. And... Um, his regime was uh, pretty conservative. It was kind of like an authoritarian state uh, that reversed a lot of the liberal policies of the Third French Republic, uh, which had been power before. Uh, and he began rounding up anybody like communists or socialists were kind of rounded up uh, under him. And he also, uh, which was very controversial, he rounded up Jews uh, in the country, which I think the Nazis forced them to do. And a lot of them were sent to like concentration and death camps, like in Poland and Germany. And uh, over 70,000 French Jews were actually killed uh, by the Nazis uh, in World War II. So it is kind of one of those things that was kind of controversial about Patain, uh, but they had no choice. Uh, if you know about the Germans kept like something like 2 million French soldiers as POWs after they had, you know, signed this armistice with the Germans. Uh, and poor, you can see they imposed forced labor on them and all that stuff like that. And so they're kind of kept as hostages. They really had no choice, uh, and I guess, to do what the Nazis wanted to do. Uh, and then another thing, too, is that the Germans were concerned that a lot of their colonies, the French, would rebel. Uh, the French had their French Navy and issues like that. Uh, so that's kind of why they divided France up into these two areas uh, that they had. Uh, then you had this other man uh, you may have heard about named Charles de Gaulle, uh, who uh, would fight the Germans. He, would, he, he didn't want to give up, uh, if you know about this. Uh, and he was this French general that fled the country. He went to uh, England, to Britain, uh, and he actually formed his own uh, French government in exile, uh, which became known as the Free, Free France, as it was called, uh, basically, and he was the head of it. Uh, and uh, this would kind of make de Gaulle one of the greatest, you know, French heroes of World War II. Uh, in fact, later he's prime minister and also uh, president of France uh, later, uh, I think under the Fourth Republic of France. Uh, and um, he would form military forces to fight uh, the Germans uh, in World War II, uh, which were called the Free French Forces, uh, which you see in this image right here uh, with the Cross of Lorraine, uh, one of their symbols. And so de Gaulle, you know, fought with the Allies in World War II. You know, he would be involved in trying to, you know, invade uh, France, like the D-Day invasion, all that in 1944. Uh, so de Gaulle, de Gaulle was kind of a, a very important figure, you know, uh, for the French fighting against the Germans. Now, on the other hand, uh, what happened was the British, you know, uh, they're fighting a lot. In fact, from 1940 to 1941, uh, that was one thing that was scary about World War II, uh, the fact that uh, the only state really fighting Nazi Germany was was Britain, you know, pretty much. Uh, and uh, you can see here an image, of course, of Winston Churchill. Churchill, of course, would become basically the prime minister. He was appointed on May 10th, 1940. Uh, Churchill, by the way, was considered one of the greatest uh, allied leaders of World War II. I think you think about him, uh, Churchill, uh, you think of Stalin, uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt, also the United States, of course, also very famous uh, in the war. And, you know, he realized, by the way, that he had a long slog, you know, pretty much to fight, you know, against against the Nazis and all that Nazi journey. He kind of compared fighting Nazi Germany almost to like the Dark Ages, uh, that the Dark Ages were kind of upon us and things like that. And so he made the famous statement, I have nothing to offer but blood, toil, tears, and sweat, was the comment he said, of course, to uh, the House of Commons uh, when he uh, became prime minister uh, at the time. Uh, and um, he became very famous for a lot of his speeches in the war. Uh, Winston Churchill, uh, of course, one of the most famous you know, speeches he probably gave uh, was the one uh, on June 4th. Yeah, June 4th, 
1940, which is the, you know, we shall fight on the beaches speech. Uh, that's well known uh, when, you know, one thing that he was able to do was to get, you know, the British soldiers out of Dunkirk, like evacuate them uh, so they could fight again uh, against against Nazi Germany uh, later. Uh, and so that's one thing that Britain would have to do. They would have to, you know, fight this long haul, you know, the, to prevent them from taking over the British Isles and, and to help, I guess, prevent them from taking their empire at this point. And so he talks about this idea of looking towards like the United States to get military aid uh, to help, of course, against them. That's one thing that does happen, of course, which is famous. You get the Battle of Britain, of course, that comes in afterwards where Britain uh, tries to fight off Nazi Germany between 1940 uh, to 1941. Uh, after the fall, after the after France fell, you know, you get this Battle of Britain that follows, uh, which occurs like in the summer fall of 1940, from July, uh, July. Uh, to about October 1940. And so the Germans at this point decide that they're going to try to attack Britain, uh, maybe invade it. And so it creates this uh, pivotal battle, Battle of Britain, which was actually an air battle, primarily, uh, where uh, the Royal Air Force, the British Air Force, uh, fought the German Luftwaffe, the German Air Force. Uh, and uh, Part of the whole operation, uh, Hitler was actually planning to invade Britain. He had this uh, amphibious operation uh, that the Germans called Operation Sea Low, uh, which in German meant Sea Lion. Uh, they were going to try to um, use, I guess, ships and barges and things like that to cross the English Channel, take England, I guess, whatever, Scotland, or whatever else. Uh, but it never got there because the fact that the Germans couldn't really neutralize uh, the British Air Force or, I guess, their Navy. Uh, and so later it was actually postponed indefinitely. I think they were going to defeat them later, but they never got to it because the Germans later, you know, attacked the Soviet Union uh, instead. Uh, of course, the Battle of Britain, uh, like I said, was primarily an air battle. Uh, the the uh, British really had an advantage over the Germans. Uh, pretty much, if you look at, you know, terrain and all that, they fought pretty much over uh, the English Channel in Britain. Uh, and so the, you know, planes, the, the fighters and bombers of, you know, the, the German, German Luftwaffe had to go further, you know, range further, of course, to fight them. And also, if you study about also the war, uh, the British had what they call radar. Uh, radar was kind of important, you know, uh, in the war. And uh, RAF Fighter Command, one thing they did was they began to break um, Britain's air airspace into different sectors uh, so that when enemy fighters or bombers came in and approached, you know, the coast and into, into England, uh, they could then send up fighter planes to go after them. And so uh, that's something you start seeing, of course, uh, pretty much in wars and pretty much anything to do with the air forces today, uh, pretty much they use uh, importance of radar is pretty pretty big. Uh, one thing about the war, though, was that the Germans uh, tried to basically, you know, bomb Britain. Uh, it was one thing, of course, they did, uh, and um, tried to bomb them in submission. Uh, that's one thing about it. And so uh, I think there's a case where the Germans actually bombed like London, other cities for like something like fifty seven consecutive nights. Uh, they tried to do this, and this became known as the Blitz. Uh, it was the common name uh, that they called it, and uh, this continuous bombing campaign would continue, I think, up to like 1944, 45. The Germans would keep trying to bomb, you know, England during the war, and um, I do know, like, during the Blitz, especially between 1940, 41, something like 40, 50,000 British were actually killed. Uh, in the war, you can see something like two th two million buildings were actually destroyed or damaged, uh, also uh, as well. And so um, the British had to evacuate to like you know basements and and you know fallout shelters and things like that today. Um, but mostly the subways. I know they use the subways like the tube to basically evacuate people to. Uh, to get away from the bombings uh, above. But I know during the war, 
uh, the Germans, the Germans would, you know, continue even using like V1, V2 type uh, vengeance weapons. They called them later. Uh, they were trying to attack, attack also England uh, as well. But in the end, uh, the Germans uh, took too much in air losses. They lost like something like 2,500 something planes or more uh, were actually lost in the Battle of Britain. Uh, and so Hitler gave up on his idea of invading Britain at that point. And so later you're going to see what's going to occur is that the Germans in 1941 will concentrate more on attacking the Soviet Union instead, which in the end was probably the worst mistake they did, of course, in the war. So that's what I want to talk about next and get into, of course, uh, is the fact that the Germans would, like I said, invade the Soviet Union, which they would uh, in June of 1941. Uh, you can see here kind of an image, of course, of it. Uh, they call it different names, but usually the code name that the Germans used was Operation Barbarossa. Of course, considered one of the largest land invasions uh, in history. Uh, something like almost 4 million troops were used uh, to invade uh, into Soviet territory. And uh, the plan of Operation Barbarossa was to defeat the Soviet Union in a short campaign, like six months or less, you know, even shorter than what they had done uh, with the French in the West. Uh, and so um, if you know about the Eastern Front, uh, the Eastern Front was the bloodiest front in World War II. Uh, later on, uh, the, the Soviets would give it a name. The Russians, you know, today called it the Great Patriotic War, which if you know about the war against Napoleon uh, in 1812, that was called the Patriotic War. And so... Um, this war in itself, almost like a separate conflict right here, uh, was like something like caused like close to like 30 million dead uh, in the war. It was that bloody uh, on both sides. Uh, and um, I think the amount of casualties I think I'll get to later was ridiculous. I think the, the Soviets had something like 10 to 11 million soldiers that were killed uh, in World War II, which is by the way the equivalent of how many soldiers died in World War I combined. That's crazy about that kind of number. I think the Germans, it was like, I want to say five, six million were probably killed uh, also fighting on the Eastern Front. Uh, back to that image, of course, right there. What was the motivation of Hitler? Uh, obviously, uh, S USSR had a lot of natural resources, minerals, especially oil, something that they critically wanted. Uh, Hitler had this idea of Lebensraum, uh, the fact that he wanted living space for Germany to expand eastward, uh, like to colonize it and all that. And I think also Hitler wanted to crush Marxism, like destroy communism and things like that in the East uh, was another issue, of course, that would also be part of it as well. So Hitler declares war on Russia, Soviet Union uh, at that point. Uh, you can see those are his main targets, obviously, to take their main cities uh, in the western part of Russia, Leningrad, Moscow, and later Stalingrad uh, also uh, as well. Uh, as they pushed eastward, um, see, of course, largest invasion of human history right here, uh, they would take a lot of different territory. So uh, East Poland would be taken over and overrun uh, pretty much uh, by the Germans. They took the Baltic states. Uh, they took where Belarus is today. And they did take pretty much majority of Ukraine. Uh, the Ukraine was also taken by the Germans uh, in World War II. And they would even invade into part of Western Russia as well. Uh, they would reach like the Black Sea and the Sea of Azov. Uh, and then into the north, they would get up to like where the Gulf of Finland is, uh, where Finland is. And Finland, of course, I told you, supported Nazi Germany in the war, uh, at least up to around like maybe 1944. Uh, as the Germans pushed eastward, they even had these Nazi death squads they had called the Eitzengruppen. Uh, and uh, these were SS killing squads uh, that were used uh, by, by Nazi Germany to eliminate anybody that was like Jews uh, that were like in part of the Soviet Union, communists, and any kind of partisans that fought against the Germans. Uh, they had them killed uh, as well, somewhere between one to two million people uh, were probably killed by the Germans, uh, by the Eitzengruppen. Uh, that's kind of kind of infamous during the war. 
Uh, also, uh, Leningrad, uh, this is something that's real famous, you know, about, about the Eastern Front. Leningrad was laid siege to uh, by Nazi Germany and also Finnish forces as well in Finland. Now it lasts something like more than two years. It was one of the longest sieges, by the way, of World War II and also in modern history, uh, lasting something like 872 days. And you can see how Leningrad was encircled, uh, basically uh, from the south, where the uh, Nazi Germany's forces in. And then you had the Finnish forces with some Germans also fighting above uh, as well, above Leningrad. And so they were kind of cut off in the war. And um, it actually resulted in like something like over one million Soviet uh deaths, like civilian and also soldier deaths of uh, fighting for control of Leningrad. Uh, but the Germans were never able to take it uh, in the war. Uh, but a lot of, I know a lot of Soviet citizens actually starved to death. I think it was even cases where people resulted to uh, cannibalism, like eating people and things like that to actually survive. That's how shortage of food things were uh, during that conflict. Uh, so there's kind of a later map showing you another one right here, close up of Leningrad being, you know, encircled right there. Um, uh, of course, the other thing that happened also, uh, the Germans in the end, by the end of 1941, uh, Operation Barbarossa actually failed. Uh, they One of the main things they were trying to do was take the capital of Moscow, of course, uh, 1941, Operation Barbarossa, the Soviets counterattacked uh, Hitler's forces, pushed them back uh, in the winter of 41 and 42. They think that the Russian winter, you know, aided uh, the Soviet forces because a lot of the Germans weren't really ready uh, for like a winter campaign. And so uh, they got caught off guard with that. And so some of their forces got pushed back and it became like almost like a stalemate. Uh, on on the Eastern Front uh, by the winter of 41 and 42. Uh, the Eastern Front is very important. Uh, we'll talk about more about it later uh, later in the week. Uh, but German losses on the on the Eastern Front has a lot to do with why Nazi Germany later collapses uh, in World War II by 1945. We'll get to uh, the Battle of Stalingrad later, but Stalingrad, you know, was the pivotal battle. Uh, that really took place uh, in World War II, especially on the Eastern Front. And after the Germans lost that battle, their forces began to retreat uh, on the Eastern Front. Now, I'm going to talk about one more thing today uh, that's kind of important that really leads to also another issue that really you know, can, you know totally you know changes the war uh, as well. That's the United States entering World War II, which we we did, of course, in December of 1941. Uh, it is considered one of the big turning points of the war. I think the other one, of course, is the Eastern Front uh, with the German defeat uh, at Stalingrad. Uh, now, the part of why we got in the war, we'll get explain this later. You can see here from this image right here, uh, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor uh, out in the Pacific. And so that's what pretty much gets us uh, into the war. But it's more than that. It's not just the fact that they, you know, attacked us. It wasn't just, you know, lead up. It wasn't just that issue that happened. It was more of a lead up uh, to events that went back to probably going back to 1937, uh, you know, three or four years uh, before, uh, where you got the rise of the Japanese Empire in Asia, in the Pacific, and things like that. And that later, later helps to cause why, you know, Japan attacks us. Uh, in December of 1941. Uh, yeah, Japan, uh, its empire was something that went back to the late 19th century. You can go back to the 1860s uh, when the Japanese empire starts to be kind of something that's imp important to them uh, by, by the you know, turn of the 20th century. And uh, between world wars, uh, Japan became this um, fascist totalitarian state, very militarized. Uh, under Emperor Hirohito at the time, and they would have this prime minister uh, named Hideki Tojo, uh, who I think at one point before that was the war minister. Uh, they were very militarized. Uh, and uh, one thing about Japan 
Uh, Japan uh, had suffered during the Great Depression. Uh, so their economy was not very good. Uh, they lacked natural resources. Uh, and so it led to a rise in uh, Japanese militarism, uh, along with also extreme Japanese nationalism, uh, thinking they were superior to other people and things like that. And so Japan sought to become like an imperial power, just like all these other powers like Britain, United States, uh, et cetera. And so Japan was basically just copying all these other powers uh, throughout, throughout the world. There's Emperor Hirohito, of course, that right on that white horse uh, right there. Uh, Hirohito was almost kind of worshipped as a kind of like as a god, god emperor, and some, something about him. Uh, in fact, he's one of the very few emperors that's still left. I think the only one, I think, that fishes an emperor, I guess, uh, or for like the emperor of Japan, as, as they call him now today. But um, Japan uh, envisioned, by the way, uh, this idea of creating uh, an imperial empire, uh, not just with Japan, but China and other parts of Asia, uh, the Pacific. And they wanted to call it the Great East Asia Co-Prosperity Sphere, where basically um, Japan favored this idea of an Asiatic empire that didn't have any kind of foreign influence uh, at all. They would kick out you know, all the foreigners, Western powers, America, things like that. An Asia for Asians, if you want to call it, basically with Japan on top. Uh, and they envisioned this, this empire being led by Hirohito uh, was basically uh, the idea of it. And Japan was very racist, um, very xenophobic. Uh, they believed that the Japanese were superior to all Asians uh, and also non-Asians as well. Uh, so I think in America, they kind of saw the Japanese as being blind and can't see and, think, and stupid and things like that. Uh, but the Japanese were very intelligent. Uh, hell, they would attack Pearl Harbor uh, pretty pretty amazingly. Uh, and so um, Japan Japan's believes that their empire is superior to other empires that are out there or, or other regimes that are pretty much worldwide. Uh, here's kind of a map showing you, of course, you know, the Japanese empire uh, in its peak. Uh, so at one point, Japan uh, would control parts of China, uh, Korea, uh, Taiwan. Uh, they would go into also like southeastern Asia, Southeast Asia, like where Indochina or Vietnam is. They, for one point, they controlled Thailand, Burma, uh, Malaysia, uh, also into the East Indies, New Guinea, Philippines. Uh, and a lot of the islands in the Western Pacific were at one point controlled uh, by them as well. So this vast empire, uh, you know, uh, is something that uh, the Japanese will try to expand into. Uh, a lot of these were uh, gotten later, uh, like from the 1930s up to like 1941. Uh, they do think that Japan really started to become an imperial power, especially after they defeated Russia in the Russo-Japanese War uh, between 1904 and 1905. Uh, and at one point, Russia had tried to control Manchuria. You see they're above Korea, but after that war, uh, Japan starts to go into that area and take it over. Uh, and uh, Manchuria was very important, by the way. Uh, the Japanese, by 1931, would seize control of that whole area. Uh, and uh, they would actually create a, Japanese puppet state out of it called Manchuko. Uh, and um, the reason why the Japanese wanted control of Manchuria uh, was because it had a lot of natural resources that were there. Uh, and uh, things like oil, rubber, lumber, uh, et cetera. Uh, and so, you know, Japan lacked natural resources, et cetera. And so that's part of why they, they wanted that area. And that's a huge area. Like the size of Manchuria is like, uh, the size of something like California, Oregon, Washington, like the western part of the United States, that would be the area of about how big uh, Manchuria is, which is now part of China today. Uh, but that area at one point was kind of um, kind of disputed about who controlled it uh, and all that. Uh, of course, what happened was by 1937, with you know Japan taking over Manchuria, 
uh, that created deterioration in relations between Japan and China, which eventually, if you know about this, caused a huge war to break out, uh, later called the Second Sino-Japanese War uh, from 1937 uh, to 1945. Uh, they do think that that was considered one of the longest conflicts of World War II. In fact, some historians even think that World War II started in Asia, not in Europe. Uh, and uh, Japan would, would then try to invade and take control of eastern China, especially all of its main ports, like its main port cities uh, that are in the east and the southern coast. And so a lot of the cities of, of China, like Nanjing or Nanking, uh, Beijing, uh, Shanghai, Hong Kong, uh, et cetera, all those would be seized uh, by, by the Japanese uh, at the beginning of the war. Uh, in fact, uh, the main uh, Japanese forces uh, that tore into China were called the Kwantung Army. Uh, they were notorious for committing a lot of atrocities against, against uh, China, which you may have heard of the so-called ra Rape of Nanking uh, that happened in December of 1937, uh, what happened was the uh, Japanese forces took the capital of China, which at the time uh, was Nanjing or Nanking. Uh, and uh, after they seized control of it, uh, the, the Japanese forces went and went crazy. And they started like just murdering people, raping women and things like that. And maybe as many as 300,000 people were killed, they think, by uh, the Japanese forces, uh, and it was considered to be one of the worst atrocities ever committed uh, by the Japanese, of course, uh, in World War II, so-called Rape of Nanking, which a lot of the Japanese uh, basically uh, don't want to say it happened, but it did. Uh, and um, there's also cases where they executed a lot of people, like Japanese soldiers, a lot of them were killed uh, by, by the Japanese afterwards, even I think some are even used just for a target practice or uh, they use just cut their heads off with samurai swords and things like that. And so a lot of the Chinese were, were a, lot, a lot of Chinese were killed in the war. If you know about China, uh, the amount of deaths in World War II is like the second worst in the war. I forget exactly the amount of Chinese that died in World War II, but it's somewhere between 10 and 15 million I think is what it is, uh, which is second by the Soviets, which I think their casualties were like, they're not sure, 20, 30 million may have been what it was, uh, some crazy amount. Uh, they even forced some of the Chinese and other women to uh, act as prostitutes. They called them comfort women. You may have heard that story about that too uh, as well. Uh, that's some of those women that were kind of forced to be prostitutes later. Uh, that's something else that they did too that was kind of, uh, famous also. Uh, so here's kind of a map showing you all the territories and uh, really between 1937 to 41, uh, that'll be the main areas that they actually conquer. Of course, the Japanese forces will later force the United States to come in and try to help retake that, uh, help the British and other allies that are in, in also the area. Uh, the United States also supported uh, the Republic of China, uh, which was led by this uh, general and later president of China, uh, Chiang Kai-shek, uh, you may have heard of uh, right there. Uh, and um, so the U.S. began sending, you know, military aid starting around 1937 uh, to 1938. We also helped the British out uh, as well. And so one thing that we started doing uh, was we started sending uh, military aid from India. Uh, into China, uh, what they did was they British and U.S. forces uh, flew a lot of air missions uh, from India uh, over Burma uh, into China. It's called the India-China Airlift, and something like 650,000 tons of material were actually sent to China uh, to aid them uh, fight, fight, of course, uh, the Japanese and uh, to a great loss of men and aircraft, by the way, they did this. It's, it's like something like over a 42-month period that they did this. And airplanes had to fly over the Himalayas. Uh, they called it flying over the hump, is what it was called, of course, later. Uh, they did this because the Japanese had taken over Thailand and Burma. They cut the Burma Road, 
And so the only way to get really into China was to fly over the Himalayas uh, in, into East Asia. Uh, also, uh, this man named Claire Chenault, you may have heard of him. He was an American uh, general. Uh, he went to China starting around 1937 and began, began to aid uh, the Chinese Air Force uh, to get them, you know, train their pilots and so on. Uh, and so um, that was another thing that happened that Chenault was very known for. He actually came back to America in 1941 and he formed this uh, outfit that was called the AVG, uh, the American Volunteer Group, uh, which they nicknamed later the Flying Tigers. And these were volunteer uh, American pilots from like U.S. Army, Navy, Marines, uh, et cetera, uh, that went over uh, to fly uh, with the Chinese to help them out in all that. And uh, they had a bunch of these Flying Tigers or famous like Tex Hill, Gregory, Gregory Boeing, too, you may have heard of him, of the Black Sheep Squadron later. Uh, Robert L. Scott is also very, very well known. And um, they're famous for, for uh, their tiger mascot they use, which uh, if you know about um, uh, the Flying Tigers, uh, the name kind of, I think, evolved from the fact that Chenault uh, attended um, Louisiana State University for about a year or so on um, Baton Rouge. Uh, was from Texas, but I think lived most of his life in Louisiana. So he's like a Louisianian. Uh, it's very famous. And uh, But they're famous for their planes, uh, the P-40 Warhawk, sometimes called Tomahawk, which is very well known for its, um, I think it's like shark's teeth that are on the front of it, uh, basically. And so uh, they were in, kind of vital in helping the Chinese Air for Force fight, fight against the Japanese uh, Air Force, which was actually pretty good at the time. So yeah, that going on uh, at the time, like up to like 1941. Uh, then, of course, the other thing that happened that, of course, very, very famous is the Japanese, you know, attack Pearl Harbor. That's in the end, the thing that really helps to get the United States involved, of course, in World War II. And, uh, you know, because of what's going on in China with, with the Japanese trying to take over China and all that, uh, the United States eventually attempts to stop them by putting like sanctions on Japan, uh, which including like embargoes, like we embargoed like uh, banning like fuel uh, shipments, oil shipments uh, to to Japan. Uh, they banned selling things like steel and scrap metal that can be used into make, you know, making war materials uh, and things like that. And so they think that that actually angered the Japanese to want to strike at the United States uh, and to you know, retaliate against us. And so that's what really, in the end, got us involved really in World War II uh, was because of that issue. So Japan would retaliate uh, using their naval forces uh, with, with uh, aircraft. Uh, they would attack Pearl Harbor. Uh, in December 7th, 1941, uh, part of why they did that, you know, uh, was the fact that the uh, Japanese wanted to neutralize the U.S. Pacific Fleet uh, that was, you know, headquartered in Hawaii, uh, in, in, in the Pacific. Uh, and so that's basically why they did that. Uh, and um, you know about the Japanese, uh, they had different uh, brainchilds behind the whole attack on Pearl Harbor. The most famous you may have heard of is Admiral Yamamoto. Uh, he was the actual uh, commander of the whole Japanese combined fleet. It was really his idea uh, to basically attack Pearl Harbor. Uh, he felt like if they could eliminate the U.S. Pacific fleet uh, that's based in Hawaii at Pearl, that that would then force the United States to sue for peace. So he was thinking that they could, you know, have a quick war uh, that would last a year or less, kind of like the Russo-Japanese War in 1904-1905. Uh, that was the idea of what, uh, you know, the, the Japanese wanted to do. And so the J Japanese amassed this huge naval task force, which they later called the so-called First Air Fleet, uh, which included six aircraft carriers, uh, to attack uh, Pearl Harbor in ha on Oahu, where the main forces were right there. Uh, those are the six aircraft carriers, of course, that were used. Uh, and um, 
They do think that the idea was also, they think Hideki Tojo, I think, was prime minister at the time of Japan. Uh, they think he was involved, too, also in the decision uh, to attack. It's kind of a debate about where whether Hirohito knew about it or whatever. They don't really know about that uh, for sure. It's never been really proven about it. Uh, but we do know that the uh, main target of the uh, first air fleet was to take out our main capital ships uh, at Pearl Harbor, uh, which were often referred to as called Battleship Row, uh, which you may have heard of. Uh, Battleship Row was an area which was kind of east of uh, Ford Island, uh, where we had our critical, you know, capital ships or battle because battleships were kind of seen as more important than say aircraft carriers uh, at at the time. Uh, that you can see kind of what it looks like on the eve of the attack uh, by the Japanese. Uh, here's kind of an image of the actual attack waves that would come in uh, to uh, Oahu uh, in Hawaii, where they would attack not just Pearl Harbor, but a lot of the air bases, uh, which would give air support, you know, to uh, the naval forces. They wanted to neutralize them, uh, not just uh, the actual ships that are there uh, as well. Here's an image of also Battleship Row, uh, bottom right, uh, you can see there. Uh, Battleship Row included these ships, about nine battleships that were there, USS Oklahoma, Maryland, Utah, California, West Virginia, Tennessee, Nevada, and Arizona uh, that are there. Uh, here's another image showing you from the air also when the first attacks came in also as well. You can see some of the Japanese planes attacking right there. Uh, the attack was pretty bad for the United States. Well, we, we, of course, took a lot of damage uh, in the conflict. Uh, about 18 ships uh, were damaged or destroyed uh, with almost 2,500 men killed uh, at, at Pearl Harbor. Uh, some of the ships that were damaged the most, if you know about it, was the USS Arizona you see here, uh, which exploded uh, with about 80% loss of its crew. Uh, the Arizona uh, was like the flagship of the main battleships that were there, uh, which, by the way, was commanded by a uh, rear admiral named Isaac Isaac Kidd, Isaac C. Kidd, you may have heard of him, uh, who the USS Kidd is named after uh, in Baton Rouge. Uh, he was killed in the battle, uh, and uh, the Arizona bur burned afterwards uh, until, like, Christmas time. Um, so... Uh, that was considered one of the worst attacks, of course, at Pearl Harbor. Uh, later, they kind of took the ship apart, like what remained of it, and the bottom of it, the keel was kind of left there. So they made the USS Arizona Memorial out of that afterwards, as you can see there, which is a popular tourist attraction, of course, uh, on Oahu. Uh, the Oklahoma was the other ship hit also as well. Uh, it actually turned on its side uh, about... Almost 1,200 men were killed on the Arizona. Oklahoma had like something like 429 men that were killed also on that ship uh, as well. Uh, and so uh, those two ships took the most damage. Uh, they were never floated afterwards. Uh, those two ships were never recovered afterwards. I think most of the other ships were kind of uh, were repaired afterwards and fought in the war. Uh, but those were, were destroyed pretty much in the war. Uh, they actually raised the Oklahoma, though, uh, but uh, you can see here a difference between the Oklahoma at top and the USS Wisconsin to kind of give you an idea of the size of the later battleships that were used, of course, uh, in, in World War II. Uh, they had one ship called the USS Shaw. It exploded, but I think it was nobody on it, uh, basically. It might have been dry dock when it blew up, but that was the most spectacular explosion that happened. Uh, at, at Pearl Harbor. Uh, of course, the result of, you know, the attack on Pearl Harbor uh, is FDR's Day of Infamy speech, where on December 8th, 1941, uh, the United States declared war uh, on Japan. Uh, and so at that point, you know, the United States are now in World War II. Uh, three days later, you know what happens Germany and also Italy declare war on us also as well. And so uh, the United States is now at war with Japan, uh, Germany, and of course also Italy as well. So basically the whole attack on Pearl Harbor, uh, that had a lot to do with why uh, the United States 
uh, came into the war. Now, whether we knew about it, you know, there's been all kinds of speculation about that. Uh, that's, and then they had warnings that, you know, at Pearl Harbor uh, that they might get attacked on Oahu, uh, but miscommunications and things like that uh, prevented really from us to really knowing what the hell was kind of going on uh, at Pearl Harbor. But it was considered to be almost like a sneak attack uh, compared to what we thought with the Japanese. And I think the Japanese were trying to declare war on us before they attacked it. Uh, but the actual declaration of war didn't actually occur until after they attacked us. Uh, so that's why that angered a lot of Americans, of course. A lot of Americans, you know, would 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 volunteer, you know, to fight this war. In fact, I had two uncles that, of course, fought in World War II uh, later. So that's it, of course, lecture-wise, part one, of course, on World War II. Uh, later in the week, I'll kind of get into and I'll talk about the end of the war from 1942 to 45. Uh, of course, the Allies are going to start winning uh, the war, like around 1942-43. Uh, eventually, they're going to defeat Nazi Germany. Uh, Italy's going to get knocked out the war, too. We'll actually switch to the uh, Allied side. Then Japan will later get defeated also as well. Uh, we'll talk about how the United States uh, dropped atomic bombs on Japan. And then we'll also talk about the atrocities of the war, like the Holocaust. I'll get to that, uh, what happened to uh, also as well. Uh, before I go, don't forget, these are the assignments that I have out right now. Uh, I told you I've got the second exam is the main thing, of course, you'll need to be working on right now. Uh, and you got those other assignments I've got down there listed too uh, that I've talked about as well. I know the third vocab is due, of course, by, by Friday uh, is the big one you'll need to kind of also work on uh, as well. So that's it for today. Uh, I'll see y'all, like I said, later in the week. Uh, to kind of wrap up on World War II. But yeah, we're getting close to, you know, the end of the semester here. Uh, I think next week I'll give you some recorded lectures I'll have too as well uh, on the Cold War era. But like I said, this week will probably be my last major live lecture I'll have, of course, for the semester. So y'all take care, and I'll see you, of course, uh, later on.